everybody. This is our final presentation of day two of Snake River Raptor Fest. My name is Matt Podolsky. I'm on the board of the Birds of Prey NCA Partnership. And I am lucky enough that I get to introduce our next presenter, which is Terry Rich. So Terry has a BS in wildlife ecology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an MS in zoology from Idaho State University, and is currently pursuing a PhD in public policy from Boise State University. Terry worked for the Bureau of Land Management for 20 years and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 15 years. He coordinated the International Bird Conservation Partnership, Partners in Flight, from 2000 to 2014. Terry is an honorary lifetime member of the American Ornithological Society. He and his wife and kids and grandkids all live in the Treasure Valley. Welcome, Terry. Thanks a lot, Matt. It's uh, really great to be here today. We're, I think a lot of us getting used to this uh, this Zoom community of ours and uh, maybe a little more comfortable than we were a few months ago. I know I am. So uh, I even got a little better background than what I had originally, which is my wife walking back and forth in the house. And that, <laughs> that was a little awkward for a while. So uh, I'm really happy to be here. And um, again, thanks for inviting me and thanks for everybody who put this together. I'm sure there were all kinds of unknown uh, problems to be overcome uh, put together a virtual conference like this. So I am, uh, I'm tickled to talk about our Western screech owls. Um, they are sitting behind this wall in a maple tree at this very moment. They still haven't left the yard, so we're excited about that. But uh, I wanna kind of walk you through what uh, we have learned this year and what we've been through um, with these owls. Um, first, I want to uh, dedicate this, my wife and I wanna dedicate this talk to uh, Althea Sherman, this is a woman we discovered as we were looking into the deep lit on uh, screech owls. And this is one of those amazing women. I'd never heard of her. She worked in Iowa on Eastern screech owls and many, many other things. As you can see long, long ago when uh, very few women did this sort of thing and even being out outdoors as a man was a little bit weirder than it is today. Happily it's become somewhat accepted, I think. Um, whoops, wrong way. So she wrote an enormous amount of literature uh, as a naturalist watching birds. She has this book that we're about to read. And she wasn't just a magazine uh, newspaper publisher or article writer. She had 70 articles in the AUK and the Wilson Bulletin and other ornithological journals. journals. So she was one of, the, one of those early naturalists who described a lot of things without big data. And it's fabulous reading. In the, I just really, uh, we both really admire her and wanted to put in a good word for her work. So what I wanna talk about today is uh, shown in this outline first, a little history of our nest box. I wanna talk about the video camera that has been the, the golden tool, uh, the trail cam we used, some uh, what I call biological issues with squirrels and other birds who want our box and we don't want them. Uh, a few technical issues having to do with the the setup of the camera, I discovered that nobody could help me. I searched online, I called people, and nobody could tell me what to do. So I figured this all out on my own, basically. Uh, and then to get into the owls themselves and just kind of walk you through a, a bit of a photo essay of the last uh, two plus, three months almost, and uh, some photos and some videos. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this as much as we have enjoyed putting it together. So uh, the nest next nest box history, we moved into this house and moved to Boise in 1992. And the very next year, 93, I put this box up in this big tree in our backyard, big old cottonwood. Um, I faced the box east. Everybody says uh, you wanna get that morning warmth coming from the sun and then shield the box from the afternoon sun when it can get way too hot. So east facing box. I actually designed this for flickers. So it's, the floor is actually too small for a screech owl. They shouldn't like it. A uh, six by seven inch floor, uh, as you can see, a true design for a screech owl's eight by 10 floor, um, all made out of unfinished and unpainted boards. You don't want chemicals leaking into the box over time out of stain or paint or anything like that. Uh, the top is hinged so you can go in it at the end of the year and um, take out debris or look at feathers. That's what we're going to do here in a little bit. And also throw out starlings and house sparrows. And I haven't had to throw out a squirrel yet, but uh, you know, be able to get in there and get rid of the birds you don't want. 
It, this box happens to be 14 and a half feet from the ground, the box opening, but that was, I think at the time, probably how tall my ladder was. You could see it could obviously be higher, but this seems to be uh, good enough. Um, I've had to reinforce the hole twice because squirrels get in there and they gnaw the hole out bigger and bigger. And now it's a bit of a tunnel, so we're gonna rectify that for next year. And even though I put the box up in 93, we didn't have a tenant we wanted until 2018. Uh, I've had flickers look at the box over the years. And I, like I said, some starlings and house sparrows that I had to boot. But uh, we didn't have owls until uh, 2018. We had no cameras at the time, so it was really a, literally a black box. We didn't know what was going on until the owls emerged. And we fledged three young out of the box that year. So here's a picture of where the tree is in Northwest Boise between Collister and Peachtree. It's an old growth cottonwood. It's, if it's not the biggest tree in this part of town, it's pretty close. So it's, it's really a standout tree. Uh, we get osprey, red tails, you know, crows, goshawks, everything in the world will perch on the top of our tree. Uh, here's an aerial view. The star is where our house is. And that all the red circles are uh, horse pastures, a church playground, a city park, a grade school. There's a plantation golf course down in the lower left. So, you know, we don't know where these birds are foraging. We, they're not um, radio transmitted or anything, so we have no idea where they're going. But I think we have a fair amount of, you know, at least potentially open space, especially these horse pastures, I think are, are probably pretty good for these owls. And the area is riddled with small canals, like I guess most of Boise is. So there's a lot of water, a lot of tall grass that doesn't get, um, doesn't get used at all because it's skated off or fenced off. Uh, in 18, my wife is a debate coach and an art teacher and a photography teacher, not an ornithologist, but she kind of became one in 2018 when we got our first owls and uh, became very enthralled uh, with their behavior and how cute they are and started uh, taking a lot of photographs and sitting on her upper deck watching the nest box. So uh, this gave me an idea, the easiest idea I've ever had for a birthday present for her that spring, which was, hey, a video camera for the box and a trail cam uh, to set outside. So first the video cam, uh, this uh, manufacturer out of Lynn, Oregon has changed his name uh, at least once, but anyway, right now it's called Birdhouse Spy Cam. So it is a, a little camera that you can fit inside the box it uh, transmits in both IR and natural light. In the middle of the night, it's doing IR. And when the sun comes up, it just starts transmitting natural light. It's quite cool. It has a microphone in it, which is really important. I'll explain in a minute. And a 75-foot cord, which uh, lets you plug the thing into an outlet in the house and um, brings in the RCA plugs with the audio and the vid uh, video feeds. So I wanted to show you uh, this picture just because having the, the plugs near the box so that you can work on the box or change the camera or uh, you know whatever you need to do, you can unplug it right there and you don't have to drag the 75 foot cord around or, uh, or un, uh, unstaple your, uh, the main part of that 75 foot of wire. So that's a nice little feature. In uh, my case, I just ran the wire down the yard, put it under, made a little trench with a shovel and buried the wire, ran around the deck and along the base of the house and then took it uh, inside the house behind our TV. So uh, if you're gonna do this, one thing is you wanna make sure the uh, tube is facing down to the outside so you don't get water running down the house and then going inside the house or into your insulation or something. So slant it that way. Um, I am always terrified when I start drilling into things that I can't see. So I got a little uh, stud finder with an electric current detector uh, from Lowe's and ran around and I, I triple, quadruple checked from the inside and the outside to make sure I knew where the wires were. There are no pipes over here, as far as I could tell, uh, but I knew where the wires were and I was able to uh, miss those, thankfully. The last thing uh, you wanna do, uh, this is, uh, is to fill that bit of pipe with some kind of hardening uh, foam so you don't get wasps and spiders and who knows what uh, coming in through the tube into your uh, family room. Uh, on, in our case, on the inside of the house, it looks like this. This is behind our TV, 
So I didn't have to make it look fancy or hide it or anything. It just sticks through the wall. You can see that little piece of sprinkler pipe, I think three quarters of an inch. <clears throat> and then the wire runs over and you plug it in and you plug in the audio visual to the back of your TV. Now, I don't know how much longer TVs are gonna have these old school RCA plugs. This is really old tech, but ours does. And you can see our first setup here was to uh, put, switch it over to auxiliary on the TV, off from cable and the other things to auxiliary. Here's the video feed from the camera. And then for us to transmit it live, this is something Pat especially really wanted to do. She set up her, her iPad on a cardboard box, nothing but the fanciest equipment here. Uh, so she's actually transmitting live to Facebook off of the TV. And that actually worked, worked really well uh, for a while, and I'll explain what happened with that. The other thing, um, I've had this really nice Sennheiser shotgun mic for many years, done a lot of bird song recording, and I found that um, just taking the mic over to one of those speakers, you can see the two tall speakers on either side of the TV, just taking the uh, mic over to one of the speakers on the birds of a vocalizing gave me a very good signal into my digital recorder. And if, if there's a little noise or a little hum or something, you can clean that out with a free, uh, free software quite easily. I use Audacity and get rid of those very low frequencies if there's a little, little bit of hum going on. So that's the video camera. The trail camera is, there's all kinds of trail cams out there. I just went to uh, Dick's Sporting Goods and pulled this off the shelf after a little bit of, just a little bit of research. It's a Moultrie M series. It's motion activated. So uh, it also shoots in IR and natural light, depending on what light is available. And it can be set to take either a still photo when something trips the, the watching mechanism or a 10 second video. And we did, we did some of both, but we started going mostly to videos as the young started moving around more and the adults started feeding more. We wanted to catch more of the action. Whoop way too fast here. Okay, video camera, uh, still camera. All right, so biological issues. So as I said, we had uh, starlings and uh, house sparrows, especially squirrels trying to get into the box constantly. We, uh, Pat decided to try to deal with the squirrels a little more effectively. This is just a little a pellet gun that shoots plastic BBs. And believe me, it, it doesn't deter the squirrels for too long but they will uh, at least run off and hide behind the trunk for a few minutes. And it, we sort of kept them from getting established in the nest box. We didn't want them to take over, have young, and then you know, become a real you know, unpleasant problem for us. Uh, one of the uh, great things about having a mic on that uh, video camera is not only being able to get the bird uh, nestling recordings, but every time a squirrel came anywhere near the nest box, we could hear it. If the TV was on, we could hear the squirrel. Well, our dog could hear the squirrel too, and our dog got very excited every time. He, every time she heard the scritching around the nest box, she would run to the patio door because she knew the next thing was we're going to go out on the patio and start blazing away with these plastic BBs. Well, like I said, no, uh, no animals were hurt; they were barely deterred, but at least it kind of kept them moving. A uh, hilarious event. In 2019, I was actually birding in Thailand and I got a text one night from my wife. She said, I think I shot a duck on the nest box. And I'm sitting there with my birding friends, you know, and we're, uh, we're doing our end of the day list and we're just yucking it up. Oh, she shot a duck. I wonder what it really was. Well, I got home a few days later and looked out the window and this isn't the picture. This is a stock photo by Steve Bly, but it looked exactly the same in our box. There was a pair of wood ducks sitting on our nest box. And in fact, as I was watching them, they also copulated there. So we knew they really liked the nest box. And it's like, uh, wood ducks are awfully nice. So we're going to let them have the box. We're going to scare them away. You know, we, it was a real dilemma. So Pat decided, let's just build another box. So you can see the box on the right then actually built to screech owl standards. Uh, so it's got the proper size floor. We put that up and we thought, well, maybe we'll have a uh, wood duck and screech owls. So that was a solution to that little problem. So the technical issues, uh, like I said, I couldn't find anybody could tell me anything and I don't know enough. So I had to kind of figure it out myself. Here's the back of my Dell XPS 8700. 
it's got all these ports and I thought, well, those little number 10 down there, some of those got that, those are RCA plugs, I'll plug it in there. Well, those are all audio out, so that didn't do any good. And it turns out, I learned after, uh, like I said, quite a bit of work, that basically everything on the computer is out except for USB. So all those other ports are all out ports. And you know that doesn't do any good, I needed in. Well, it turns out after calling RGM computers here in town who didn't know what was going on, they said, you need this little device here. Uh, if you wanna see all the excruciating details of my failure to figure out the tech, you can look at our blog, the Peachtree Owls, and look at post number 13. Uh, if you just wanna cut to the chase, buy this device, it's like $9 online. I think RGM got a few bucks more, but because of their technical uh, advice, it was well worth it. So then you just plug those, those RCA plugs into the uh, two of those uh, colored jacks there and plug the EasyCap into uh, USB. Curiously, this is still USB 2, not 3. It didn't seem to affect anything we were doing. Well, the tech issues weren't over yet. Um, as we were posed, as Pat was feeding this live to Facebook, and Matt, I hope you don't run into this for some reason, you can see we were getting these account warnings and they would stop the live feed. And when you went to the warning, it says your post didn't follow our community standards on nudity and sexual activity. So we're like, what? And uh, we got this many times and we challenged them, but there's nobody evaluating these videos except robots. So there's nobody to talk to. Uh, there's no learning going on. So we said, okay, forget Facebook. We're gonna go to YouTube. Well, I already had a YouTube channel where I've been putting my talks for a couple of years, and I thought, well, stream it there. So great, that worked for a while. And then we started getting booted off YouTube, basically for the same reason, reason for violating community standards. They would either remove the video or the thumbnail, the little, you know, little thumbnail you'd click on to watch the video. Uh, this happened, I don't know, 25, 30, 35 times. Every time that happened, they sent us an email and said, hey, we're, we kicked you off because you violated standards, and we're trying to figure out what standards, you can't figure out anything. And, but they say you can appeal it. So I appealed every one of these um, removals and rejections, and they would always come back and say, oh, okay, it, you're okay, we're, we put your video back up, we put your thumbnail back up. But we had to keep going through it and through it. There was no learning going on. Uh, there were robots running the process who were incapable of, of learning. And uh, so that was pretty frustrating because if they kick us off in the middle of the night, then we, we lose that because YouTube is recording the video and archiving it. And if they kick us off, then we, we lose that. Uh, so next year, we're going to look at Vimeo or maybe I'll talk to Matt about some other options for live streaming. Well, we'll, we'll just pay for the service and make sure they don't kick us off for very odd, uh, obscure reasons. All right, enough all the tech. Let's look at some owls. So uh, anytime I want to know something about birds, I go to the birds of the world. And it used to be birds of North America. You may know they recently expanded to include the entire world. And of course, the Western screech owl uh, piece is there. For those of you who don't know, there's also an Eastern screech owl. That's the uh, bird that Althea Sherman worked on in Iowa. And when you, the, Fantastic thing about these accounts is they're, they're just so detailed. They're basically Oxford English Dictionary for Bird Species. And when you go into the menu and click on breeding, that opens up to all these items that we were gonna be able to uh, learn something about. Nest site, nest, eggs, incubation, hatching, young birds, parental care, uh, fledgling stage. So the, all of that stuff we knew we uh, were gonna be able to learn something about and maybe contribute. And I, I was really fascinated when you look at the citation dates in, the, in that section on breeding, you can see how old many of them are. So even back to, I think it's 1892, the, uh, there's still some, some information from those days, from the days when Althea Sherman was working, that, that are, it's still cited because that may be the only bit on some aspect of their breeding behavior. So, so these birds um, have been, you know, studied off and on over the years, but a lot, of, a lot of the information is quite old. And we actually, as I'll say at the end, found some things that as far as I can tell, had not been observed or documented. So let's walk through a little bit of the uh, chronology of our experience here with some pictures and some short videos. 
Uh, my, my log file is now 45 pages long, and uh, I wish it were better organized than it probably is. Uh, thankfully, we can always search for things like first egg. Uh, so uh, the first entry was March 10th at 6.50 in the morning. Uh, an adult stuck its head into the box for about a second or less and left. And it was so quick, um, we weren't sure if it was a squirrel nose or an owl nose, uh, just barely into the box. To, be picked up by the video camera. Uh, I thought I saw some stripes on the head, so I was pretty sure it was this female, and um, surely it was. Uh, we later located the male. You can tell him apart almost immediately because he always keeps his ears quite, uh, quite erect, and I think they can control those, but the female seems to keep her ears laid down a lot, and he always looks like he's ready for a fight, and maybe he literally is. Uh, he's also got a few facial features that are subtly different, and so we learned to identify them right away. And I, I suspect this is the case for any owls. They have enough minor distance, uh, differences in the way they look and their, and their um, intelligent uh, plumage that you can tell what they are. Uh, the first thing that we were picking up uh, it gets us very excited is when the birds start hanging around the neighborhood and start hanging out around the yard and calling back and forth. And I went to Zeno Canto, and I think I listened to every one of their files went to All About Birds. You know, Canto is a global database of bird songs. Anything you want to hear on the planet, you can go listen to. In some cases, there are hundreds of uh, song files there. And I didn't hear anything on Zeno Canto, uh, or I should say I didn't hear anything in the yard that I didn't hear on Zeno Canto. They were doing absolutely typical um, male-female calls back and forth. Uh, nothing unusual, nothing tricky. So I'm not going to spend any more particular time on that if you want to uh, Go to these files, these sites, you know, you can listen to Screech Owls for a long time. So the, uh, the first, uh, I got my little video box blocking part of the screen. There we go. So the first uh, things, of course, we were very excited about was the egg laying. And she tricked us quite a few times. She would go into the box and nestle down like a, maybe like a hen chicken, nestle down in the substrate and sometimes kick stuff up in the air and cause a lot of debris to fly around. And several times, like, I mean, over several days, I thought, okay, that's egg laying. And then she leaves and there's no, that wasn't egg laying. She's just getting ready to lay eggs. So finally on March 27th, we got our first egg. On March 29th, uh, the second, and then on April 1st, the third. And that's all we ended up with was three eggs. Uh, you can see here the clutch size is two to seven. Seven's very unusual. Uh, the mean is about five. So this is definitely on the small end, and it could be the result of a, a young female, maybe a first year female. It could be her nutrition isn't, wasn't up to snuff so where she could crank out more eggs. And um, maybe the box was too small. We don't, we don't know what the reason was, but we got three eggs and we were very happy to have them. The uh, first egg hatched on April 27th, 31 days later. And this was amazing. We actually, I'm gonna play this little uh, video clip. As far as I know, this hadn't been documented. The, the, uh, the uh, young birds actually chirp in the eggs and this first hatchling and the young in the eggs are, are chirping back and forth to each other. Let's see, I don't know, I'm not sure how well this will uh, come across, but we'll give it a whirl here. Okay, hopefully that came across okay. They did that almost constantly in this first hatchling. We have a lot of pictures, it's so cute. Would lay on the other two eggs with its little wings stretched over them. I mean, you can't make this up. It was just as cute as it can be and they're just chirping back and forth. Uh, and so we'll, we hope to, uh, we'll get that posted up to uh, Zeno Canto and send it up to Macaulay Library at Cornell. And uh, they maybe already have that stuff, but so far I can't tell that they do. So maybe this is new stuff. Um, so, okay, that's it. Okay.
on to the next one. Okay, so uh, April 28th, the, the second uh, and third young hatched, we think maybe six or eight hours apart. So uh, it turned out, you can see there are 30 days for the second chick and 27 days for the third chick. But what's fairly common with these, these uh, birds that lay asynchronously, that is they lay the eggs over a period of days, in this case, five days apart, and they actually hatched only one day apart. So uh, the uh, female doesn't incubate or doesn't incubate completely with that first uh, egg. She kind of waits so that, that those later eggs can uh, catch up and basically they hatch together. Uh, sad story with these three, and it's fairly typical that third egg, that little uh, chick was a little bit smaller and I think maybe had was a little bit challenged in some other way, it didn't hold its head up as much. And after about five or six days, it just was not getting any food and it, it finally died. So that was a real heartbreak for us. Oh, <clears throat> sorry, going back and forth. All right. So most of the day when uh, you look in on the female, you, this is it. You know, she's sitting on the egg, she's sitting on the young, she doesn't move like the, the whole daylight hour except to turn around. When she had eggs, she would get up and you can't see under her at all. If somebody can get a, figure out a camera that can see under the bird, that would be great. Uh, cameras on the side are gonna be blocked, camera on the bottom are gonna be blocked. You need like a really tiny uh, fisheye lens of some kind. But she would stand up and probably just roll the eggs. She was rolling the eggs and changing her own position, I'm sure just for personal comfort. So a typical day is nothing happening, uh, but we watch nonstop anyway. Uh, around 8.30, 9 o'clock in the evening, she would get up and go to the door and stick her head out like this. Uh, this is when we start getting excited because for the first time we're going to be able to see what's in the box. So she'd do this for, it varied quite a bit, maybe a couple of minutes, but often it was eight, nine, 10 minutes. She'd just sit there looking out and then she'd take off. Here's one of the pictures uh, from the uh, trail cam in the middle of the night. You can see the, how the IR picks up uh, the eye shine, and we'll see some more of this. So when she leaves, and we can see what has happened uh, during the night and maybe early in the morning that we were not able to see. It may be on the video that we haven't looked at yet. It's archived. But I picked this one because this is the first time after seeing a number of other things delivered that were not vertebrates. It was obviously a headless bird. Usually the adults take the heads off and possibly in the other corner, a, a microtus or a house mouse or something. At this stage, the young are too little to deal with this food. They don't know what's going on. They're just huddled up there. So she'll come back and uh, start chewing up the, these prey items and either feeding them bits or I think more likely at this stage, she's gonna eat all this stuff and then regurgitate it to them while they're quite small. After they get a little bigger, they just tear this stuff up and they know what to do. But at this stage, a few days old, they, they can't deal with this. They don't even know what's going on. Uh, here's a, probably a Pacific tree frog. We saw a couple of these brought in, and I've got some video somewhere, if I can find it, of one of the older young trying to swallow a frog hole. It's hilarious. Uh, stay tuned, we'll try to get that up and, and point it out to people on, on my YouTube channel. And you can see some other debris in the back can't quite tell what it is due to the resolution of the camera. Uh, it looks like maybe more mice to me, kind of the grayish look. Uh, the first big discovery on food provisioning was this shot of the male. Uh, look at the size of that night crawler. Uh, I've lived here since 92 and I've never seen, and I'm out with walking my dog, going to dog park, riding my bike. I've never seen a night crawler like this in my neighborhood. So I don't know where this bird is getting these night crawlers, but you're gonna see some more of these guys. So here's, here's the big, uh, treasure for these birds, a lot of night crawlers. And one of the blog posts you can look at is I thought, well, how nutritious are night crawlers? These can't be so great. Maybe that's why she only laid three eggs. Well, it turns out night crawlers and earthworms are loaded with nutrients. They have a lot of micronutrients, they have calcium, they have fat, protein, uh, a lot of water. And of course, these birds aren't drinking. So this is actually maybe the perfect food for these birds. So uh, whether they're, they're getting worms because they're great or because that's Mostly what's available, we don't know, but it's a, it's a wonderful food actually for these, these uh, young owls. Uh, the other thing, we, we saw something being delivered for several days at, at night, small things that were kind of light colored. We could not tell what they were. I, they always looked to me like a little square piece of ravioli. Well, here's your ravioli. Uh, 
few a uh, week or two ago when my grandkids were over and my grandson here, Vander, wanted to find some roly poly bugs. So we were turning over, uh, digging through leaf litter and flipping over boards and looking under rocks and everything and found lots of roly polies and centipedes and every sort of thing. But we found a couple of these big, uh, um, these big, now the word flew out of my mind. What are these things? I forgot what they're called. Slugs. Slugs, slugs thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So slugs. So they were they were feeding slugs, um, and so we realized that was the main provisioning for uh, quite a long time. Now slugs are also very nutritious, but uh, if you want to read some nightmares, these guys carry some parasites you do not want to get near. So if you get into a slug or snail swallowing dare, do not take it. Uh, believe me, go look it up. You will not. You don't want to get involved in some of the parasites these things carry. Apparently, it does affect the owls. Uh, as the young got older, we started to see them. This uh, immediately reminded me of Casper the Friendly Ghost. People who are 70 years old or older, uh, cute little uh, white ball, eyes closed, two little ones. And remember now the third chick has, has uh, died by now and is no longer with us. So the eyes are closed for quite a while. I don't know exactly how many days we can look it up. Uh, and then they start uh, opening their eyes and they just get cuter and cuter. Of course, they're getting bigger now, so they're starting to pop out around mom where we can see them and, uh, during the day, and so that's, that was a fun stage. Of course, they grow pretty rapidly. Um, I could show you more increments, but you get the idea. The feathers are starting to push out the down, and any time they're uh, ruffling their feathers or flapping their wings, the box is just full of little bits of down flying around in the sunlight and going out the door. Very cute. Uh, as they get bigger, they start peeking out. This is always our favorite stage. And in 2018, you know, we didn't know what was going on until this stage right here, because we couldn't see in the box. Uh, we didn't want to go in the box. We didn't have a camera. So this is very exciting when they start looking out. Uh, the inner inside view when they're doing that, uh, there's half a bird in and half a bird out sort of thing. And the other one waiting in the background. Uh, here's another picture. Uh, people ask about why those nails aren't pounded all the way in. I thought I might have to take that board off and put on a metal uh, protector on the hole. Uh, I never did, and it didn't seem to cause any problems, but we won't have those sticking out again. Uh, so here is just a, one of the many videos we've got. This is very early in the morning, uh, and there's a squirrel. You see two squirrels, and the owl's looking out and watching the squirrels. And of course, you know, this, this owl is just seeing the world for the first time. I uh, would love to know what was going through his head when he's watching these squirrels running around. Uh, here is uh, one of the nighttime videos, one of the 10 second clips from the trail cam. This is another uh, night crawler that you can see dangling from the adult's mouth on the lower perch. And you can see they don't mess around with small worms. They're always these big things, still wondering where in the world they live. Another one of just the bird uh, looking, the young one looking out and the adult uh, flying across. I think I might've missed one. Let me go back a bit. Oh, I guess not. Okay, oh, here it is. Okay, watch this one now. This is where, I'll play this twice because it's so funny. So the adult is up on the box feeding the young whose head is sticking out. Now watch the young. See the worm hanging in its mouth? Watch. Boop, 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 boop. We, we call this video, we label this one slurp. I'm going to play it one more time. Oh my gosh, hilarious. And that happened quite a few times. We've got quite a few clips exactly like that. So uh, here's just a couple of stills that shows how the uh, adult sort of hangs on to the side of the box. I've been impressed in watching them on the box and on the tree trunks, how um, they don't quite have squirrel feet, but they can hang on pretty well onto like a vertical surface. They don't, doesn't seem to be a problem. Feeding the young, looking around and heading out. 
So uh, these two young fledged on May 27th and May 28th. This is exactly 30 days for each one. Uh, the first bird who fledged went into our arborvita, a thick patch of arborvita in the backyard, and we could not tell where he or she was. But as soon as the second one fledged, uh, they immediately hooked up, and that next morning they were sitting right next to each other. You can see the one obviously with the eyes, but just to that bird's left, you can see the other bird uh, with its back to us. And they have been stuck to each other to this, as of a half hour ago when I went and looked at them, they sit right next to each other all the time out in the trees. Just a couple more pictures of them as they're getting a little bigger. And this is pretty far apart, actually. Here's, uh, I'm gonna play this one twice as well. If you see in the lower uh, left is an adult with an earthworm and up in the ver very near the top and slightly right of center, you can see some eye shine of one of the young birds. And I'll play it twice so you can watch this worm delivery. Find the start button. See that worm? I'll play one more time again. You can note the eye shine. So that's fun. So they're getting bigger almost day to day. You can see them get bigger. I'm sure if you weighed them, you would see, see that increment. Uh, they're cute from every angle. So pretty fluffy and downy on the bottom end. Anytime you find either the female, again, uh, the male, we haven't seen the male for days, but he's feeding at night. But during the day, if you can find the female, the young are not very far apart and vice versa. Whoever we find first, we can find the others uh, within a few seconds, we know where to look. Uh, it's amazing how hard it is to find them. We've only got the arborvitaes, two maple trees, and a cottonwood. But this morning, it took me probably 20, 25 minutes to figure out where they were. All right, so uh, getting near the end here, we're going to upgrade the box uh, for next year. We're going to use Pat's box, which is built for screech owls. You can see it here. Uh, it's got a front side perch. We think they're going to appreciate that. Uh, both the adults when they're feeding, they don't have to just hang on like a rock climber out there. It's got a lovely colored top. Uh, the paint is only on the outside and that's to help keep uh, moisture out. The inside is not painted. Put designs on there. I'm sure they appreciate that. Probably stick in a remote thermometer. I'm very curious about the temperature regime in there. And we have a uh, which is second camera, which is wireless, but we haven't been able to get it to work yet. So we'll see if we're going to uh, swap cameras or maybe use both cameras or what, we're not sure exactly just yet. So what did we learn? Uh, first off, it's utterly fascinating. We uh, found ourselves watching very little TV or binging on Netflix, or if we did watch something uh, after we got the feed into my computer, the owls are always on, right? always on. And we would frequently stop some show and if anything happened with the owls, we're watching the owls. So we were, we've been entertained since March 10th basically. And uh, viewers said it watching on Facebook and especially on YouTube, got lots and lots of comments uh, saying how much they enjoyed it and thanking us and all that stuff. And we're just, we're just happy to share this, hoping that people will get, you know, become closer to these birds and also, uh, you know, um, maybe become more interested in conserving birds in the end. That's always kind of my bottom line. We uh, got a lot of natural history data, you know, old school, it's one nest box, it's one pair of birds. So we're, it's not big data, but there's some things there we think we can contribute. Certainly some new food items that were, have not been mentioned, birds of the world. New vocalizations, or at least vocalizations that haven't been documented as far as we can tell. I think we could learn a lot more about the vocals uh, if we wanted to go through some of the patterns, see if there are some patterns. We've got a lot of material still to work with. Like I said, my log file, we've got the debris in the nest box where you're gonna see what kind of feathers are in there. We've got hundreds of these 10 second videos like the slurp slurp video that we have not really looked at closely and at least 70 hours of nighttime video archived at YouTube. Uh, I haven't even looked at any of that or hardly any of it. So I don't know what's there. There's gonna be a lot, uh, I think more 
hopefully interesting things to extract. Finally, uh, if you want to do this, you can kind of got the how to. And if you want to contact me, I'd be happy to uh, walk you through it or look at the, the blog post, it gives all the details on the wiring. But you know, you might find uh, some new food items in whatever area you're in. I think the, uh, the vocalizations, like I said, we don't, we don't know if there's patterns there, if they're just basically saying, I'm here, I'm here, you're there, I'm here. Is there more to it than that? We don't know. I think the thermal environment of the nest box is interesting. And again, just sharing this with other people. So uh, get more people interested in these incredibly beautiful and cute raptors. And, and again, maybe they will take a step into bird conservation that they wouldn't have before. Uh, I finally, I think, got a picture I can submit to some uh, photo contest somewhere of this young owl just happened to have its head cocked and its mouth partly open. Uh, you caption it, but I think, hey, mom, isn't this fun? Uh, works pretty well. She, mom does not seem amused, and he seems to be, he or she seems to be having a good old time, not being in a box. Uh, finally, uh, there's the, uh, the blog spot if you want to go read uh, our blog. The YouTube videos are on Bird Talk with Terry Rich, and we want to part, part with one final video with a little bit of music to it. Thank you.